bad inlining. I'm going to leave a beat there. Sounds like a, like a pop band. A, a, a hop band? No, a pop band. A pop band. I thought you, were, you made up a new genre. It's like hip hop, but it's not so hip. <laughs> It's just, <laughs> just hop. Just a hop band. <laughs> so. So. I've been looking at the performance of some websites recently, uh, specifically Formula One websites, but I also looked at the, mm -hmm. the Google I.O. website. And I can't do an episode on that because showing other people's websites lands us in all kinds of legal difficulty and checks. Um, so I can't do that, but instead, what I'm going to do is show you the top 10 web performance pitfalls that I have seen while looking at a variety of different sites recently. Um, I had nine good ones, but then once I had nine... What, I have a 10? Got to throw in a 10th, haven't you? Because it sounds better. It's the one, like, which, which video are you going to look at on YouTube? The top nine? No. Oh, the top 10. Yes, absolutely. So that's what this is, the top 10. Uh, first, we should talk about how a page actually loads or how it should load. Oh, wow. We're going back to the basics. Oh, yeah. Well, this is mostly load time performance stuff. In fact, almost exclusively, this is, this is load performance. Uh, I would say, first up, you need whatever you need to display core content. For a news article, it's the content, you know, it's the text uh, or, or the image, if the image is part of the core content as well. You know, same for a blog post. If it's more app-like, then maybe this is just um, the shell of a user interface. Uh, don't render buttons that don't work. That's, you know, it's annoying. No one likes clicking buttons and nothing happens. So you would just like maybe have the shell of a user interface. Next, it's what you need to make that first interaction work. Uh, for a blog post or a new story, the main interaction is reading. So there's probably not too much to worry about here. Um, for an app more like you know, Squoosh or something, this is where you make the buttons work. This is where you make those buttons appear. Uh, so that first interaction is there. And then there's everything else. This is a bit of a simplified model. Um, you can introduce more phases, more progressions, whatever. But really, if more of the web just had these three phases, everything would be so much faster. And I'm going to show you some things that have happened that stop this model working correctly, uh, the things that get in the way. So in number 10, and remember I said I just kind of threw one in to make up the numbers. That's this one. In number 10, it is sprites and icon fonts. Ta-da. I mean, by very definition, they load more than you need. Yes. And if this happens less and less now, which is why it's way down on my list. But I have seen this cause a delay, especially to the uh, interactivity part. Here's a sprite. Um, like I say, I can't show stuff from other sites. So here's a Google one. This is what you'll find on google.com. So it's one image file, and it contains a whole bunch of icons. We used to do this in the HTTP 1.1 days, because in HTTP 1, you could only download one thing at a time. Uh, we used to spin up multiple connections, so you could download more things in parallel. So if you had um, 60 icons or, or whatever, it's that's lots of connections that you will need to spin up. Well, with HTTP 1.1, you would spin up six, but you would only be downloading six at a time. And yeah. I was about to say, because you couldn't even spin arbitrary, spin up arbitrary amounts of connections. Those were limited by spec to six. So you had six requests in parallel at most. So reducing. I think the spec limited to, to two. Browsers quickly ignored the spec. Oh, OK. That's good to know. It was still pretty limited to between six and 10, depending on the browser from memory. So this image here on, on the Google site is 100K. But individually, those icons, a lot of them are 500 bytes if you encode them individually. Google does use all of these icons at once. There's a little button you press, and it shows you all of the different Google apps, and, and they all appear at once. So it's not too bad. But what I've seen on other sites is like a, a 300K sprite sheet, but the page is only using one of those. And that means the yeah. user is paying 300K for one image that could be 500 bytes. I'm guessing their point was it, it's in the cache, so all subsequent loadings of another icons would be super fast. But the first impression matters. This is uh, really at the root of web performance. Is uh, A lot of sites are built with this model of like, well, let's prepare everything in advance and then give you something. And it's just not a model that really works. 
it it depends on the user doing particular things afterwards. But you can get the same benefit by giving them everything they need first and then downloading the rest in, in the background. And you get that same, you're ready for the next thing, but you didn't compromise showing them the first thing. And that's really those phases that I'm talking about. Okay, and it's the same with icon fonts. Uh, we saw that actually on the Google I.O. website. They were pulling in a whole icon font and they were using the hamburger icon and that was it. So that's like 50K for what should be like 30 bytes or whatever. I would say, yeah, avoid it these days. Just serve the stuff separately. It means the browser can be smart about which icons it needs, which icons it needs with higher priority. Yeah, it's just, it's just something we don't need to do anymore in the world of HTTP2. Next up, number nine, DOM ready delay. And this was one that I didn't expect to come up, but it, it did appear on a couple of sites. It's a real gotcha, actually. Uh, this, is what it, this is what it looks like. So you've got your main script in the head. It's got, it's got defer, you know, so it doesn't block rendering. Great. And then at the bottom of the body, you've got some less important scripts. And they're using defer as well. So there's no render blocking going on here. It all looks good on the surface, but in the first script, it does this. And it might not do that literally. It might be using some like jQuery ready function or the, some other kind of ready function that bundles with, with a library. But if it uses DOM content loaded under the hood, that will wait for all other deferred scripts to download and to execute. And so this, this kind of model that looks great from the HTML, where you've got like one thing at the top there and then the less important stuff further down, it, it's spoiled by having this DOM ready thing. Is the correct alternative then DOM ready? Because there's a second event, right? Which basically what we're looking for is the an event the DOM parsing from the index HTML is done. So there is another thing called ready state, which has which has two points, one which is before the deferred scripts and one which is after. So you can use that. But hey, if your script is defer, it's already going to wait until the DOM's ready anyway. So the solution here is just don't use it. Right? You know, don't use DOM ready. Um, there might be cases where someone added this code in because one of the other scripts adds something in that they need or, or whatever. But if you need a certain part of the DOM to be there and then you enhance it, there are better ways of doing that. Uh, there are web components. Now, you don't have to go all in on web components with Shadow DOM and all of that, but you can use just the, the, the shell of a custom element as a way to, to be alerted that when an element uh, appears on the page. There are mutation observers as well, but really, in most cases, I would say just, you know, if you've got a deferred script, that's going to run when the DOM is ready. Off you go. Next one, number eight. This is bad inlining. All right, so inlining is when we bundle one asset inside another. I mean, we, we tend to use inlining to refer to some particular kinds of formats. Like we, we don't tend to do it when you bundle JavaScript within JavaScript, we just call that bundling. Inlining tends to be another format inside another format. And it's often great for micro optimizations. But when it goes wrong, it goes wrong badly. So I'm going to do a countdown within a countdown. Here we go. Here are the ways that I've seen inlining go wrong. First up, JavaScript. Uh, inlining JavaScript for your first interaction tends to be a really good way of doing things. Um, we, we did this on Squoosh. We've got all of our JavaScript for our first interaction inlined at the bottom of the document. Um, but yeah, it should go after everything that's needed for the first render. And your first render is HTML and CSS. I actually saw a couple of sites recently that had a few hundred K of JavaScript right at the top of the document. And this is pretty much as bad as a blocking script. The browser has to download 100K's worth of stuff before it can render the content, before it can discover things like images and, and maybe other things like you know CSS and, and other scripts. And, and yeah, you're saving an extra request, but also you're giving up lots of cache granularity and all other kinds of things. So inlining is, you said, like, is a good tool to have, but you should use it very consciously and with small units. Absolutely. Yeah, avoid blocking your content render on JavaScript is good advice in general, uh, but just inlining it is just the same problem, but in a different spelling. You know, it's, it's the same thing. So you put it at the either in a separate file is fine, uh, as long as it's loading in a non blocking way using defer or async. Um, next one images. I would say it's almost always a bad idea to inline images because they can be quite big. 
and it's the kind of thing that you could have involved in your build script and someone changes the image, doesn't compress it as well or something, and it turns from like a moderately bad thing to a really, really terrible thing. Um, I saw one website where they had an SVG, because SVG is small, right? But inside that SVG, they had a 1.9 megabytes PNG in line. <laughs> it, it was, you know, and something had gone wrong there. They didn't mean to do that, but because it was inlined, because the, well, the SVG was inlined in the JavaScript as well, so it became like a, a huge, huge problem. And also, base64 will make your data one third bigger. Then. Yes, which um, I mean, you spoke about Huffman coding in the last episode does give you a lot of that back. But um, yeah, it's still uh, quite a bit bigger. Um, I want to call out SVG specifically, because inline images doesn't happen so much, but inline SVG is happening a lot more, because you can put it in your HTML, you can put it in your CSS, you can put it in your JavaScript. And it's sometimes a really good micro-optimization, but it can also be big. I saw a site. Uh, that had a set of sponsor icons that quite high up in their page before the main content. And it all added up to be like a few hundred K of SVG. Damn. Yeah. yeah that's... So, and because and it's inlined, it's now blocking the main content and, and other things. If it's in separate files, it means the browser can, you know, apply different priorities to different icons, especially if you scroll away before it loads them. Uh, it can do the right thing, and it can also render that main content much earlier. My main reason for inlining SVG is because I want it to be affected by my CSS, which yes. as an image tag, it doesn't do. I know. I feel that we, it would be good if there was a better way to do that. Like somehow have a you know SVG that comes from an external file, but it, it can be um, affected by your HTML. I guess really the answer there is just fetch it with JavaScript and then put it in the page. We'll give you that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. One thing I see a lot right now, um, and I think it's for the same reasons you mentioned there, is people putting SVG in their JavaScript, uh, but as JSX. So it's been converted to you know the, the, the pure JavaScript interpretation of JSX, which does add some overhead. Um, and you end up with these large, complicated bits of SVG uh, are now in the JavaScript. And that's a problem for your first interaction. Because if your first interaction contains like, these icons, especially if they're icons that you don't need right now, they're adding size to your JavaScript, it means it downloads slower. Your first interaction happens later. All right, next one is the big one. Can you guess what it is? Um, <laughs> that was. I don't horrible. think. I don't. I don't think it's woof. No, it's not woof. It, woof is a really good format of this type of file, though. I was going to say, like, it, it, is it is it web fonts, but I think we should wait it's, until, it's fonts, yeah. Yeah, yeah. until Watson has calmed the f down. Um, yes, it is it is woofs. Inlining woofs is bad. You are absolutely correct. It is web fonts. Uh, especially because you know this is going to be inside your CSS. CSS blocks rendering. And so if you add 500k of fonts to that, <laughs> that means blocking for a lot longer. And this, this is what I've seen. Now, fonts are difficult when it comes to web performance, because it you know while the font's downloading, it might mean that your text is blocked or that your text will swap, which is also not great. But when you inline font data, it's going to block the whole rendering of the page. And also, it could be blocking rendering on fonts you don't even use on that page. And that's what I was seeing. So. Almost never do this. I say almost never because you know there are cases where if you subset the font to just a few characters, you can get away with it. But you, you know, you have. To I was really about to say you saying. do it on Prox. You actually build it for Prox where we inline a font, but specifically only the letters that we use for the first render. Yes, and I do it in Squoosh as well. The Squoosh logo is ah, just the letters awesome. for Squoosh uh, inside that SVG file. So. Yes. Okay. There are cases where it's good, but you you have to be so careful. Um, it's yeah. It can't just be for for general fonts. All right. Back to the main countdown. We love talking about images. Let's talk about some big images. Images download in parallel. They don't block things like you know rendering. They don't block rendering like CSS blocks rendering. And also the browser is smart. Like 
it gives images in the viewport a different priority to images outside the viewport. So what is what is the problem here? In the viewport, images have the same priority or higher as than script. So if your image is too big, that can delay your first interaction because the image and that script are going to be fighting for like the you know the same bit of bandwidth. Because just because like HTTP two can download things in parallel doesn't mean you magically get twice the bandwidth that you have, right? It's still you know sharing those things out. So it's another opportunity for us to plug Squoosh. Use Squoosh, make your images smaller. Many images I see on the web could be a tenth of the size. And it's not always down to using some new format that's only supported in Chrome, which I'm talking about AVIF here, but like even just as a JPEG, things could be so much smaller. And WebP has, has really good support now as well. Yeah, I did a couple of experiments. About 50% of a page weight is images on average, according to HV Archive at least. And the vast majority of those images can be compressed to half their size, even fully automatically without perceptible loss of quality. So we really have a lot of things we can do better with images on the web. Absolutely. Yeah. And as I say, a lot of time, it doesn't matter. It just means that image is going to load slow. But in some cases, it delays like more important things. Uh, another thing that I want, I want to point out that sort of gets lost, uh, a lot of people don't know about, is that this image will still load. Like, images predate CSS by some years. Uh, so the idea that images load before layout um, or before CSS layout, well, it happens before because they existed before CSS layout even existed. So this will download. Uh, the, the browser will download it at low priority. It will still use bandwidth, of course, uh, but it will be at low priority because it knows it's not in the viewport. This won't. This means that the image is now dependent on the layout and so it knows it's not part of the layout, so it won't download. That's something I didn't know and I find it really interesting that you could, I guess it makes sense because the image tag has been used to preload images via JavaScript without even being attached to the document, so it needs to load. But that loading equals lazy now had to actually introduce image to be self-aware about whether or not it is being laid out and where it is being laid out, that that changed that behavior, something I didn't realize. Yeah, and that comes at a cost as well. So don't just put this on all of your images, because especially for your main image at your top of your screen, uh, if you put that, uh, if you put loading lazy on that, then the browser has to download the CSS. It has to lay out the page, uh, and then it will go, oh, there's an image here. I'll start downloading that. Whereas without uh, without that attribute, it will start start downloading the image uh, much sooner. So yeah, it, it, use it on things that you know are not going to be needed yet, but don't use it on images right at the top of the page. All right, next up, sticking with images, but this time how they're loaded. Loading main images with JavaScript, I see this a lot. HTTP2 is very good at loading things in parallel. The browser is good at figuring out the priority things should be most of the time. Sometimes it gets it wrong, but it's good most of the time. But the problem with loading content with JavaScript is the JavaScript has to load and execute before the browser knows anything about the next thing. You know, uh, So I see this kind of thing going on where there's uh, an image carousel sort of thing that's powered by JavaScript. And it will just be divs on the page with data attributes, which mean nothing to the browser, or some JavaScript implementation of responsive images. And then some JavaScript comes in, goes, oh, this should be an image. And it creates the image, and then it starts downloading. But that's many, many seconds later, depending on the, on the connection. And you can't Band-Aid fix it with like a preload or a prefetch, but really, you should be using the elements that are given to you by the platform here. And you're absolutely right. One workaround is to use preload, which is a good way to tell the browser about stuff that's going to be needed later. Um, but yeah, really, you should only use preload if you're out of better options. And in this case, we have the image tag, which is pretty good at loading images. And responsive images have really good support across browsers. So there you go. The browser will see this as soon as it parses the page. And it will prioritize it accordingly, use all of the smarts that are built into the browser. All right, next up, number five. Uh, halfway through the list now, primary resources on other origins. I saw this on almost every site that I audited. Uh, it looks like this. Uh, I've seen it with Unpackage specifically a few times, but also just separate CDNs or separate services or whatever. HTTP2 is great. It means you can have many things uh, downloading in parallel 
over the same connection. But because this is pointing to a different server, it has to then set up another connection. And this is this is one of those things that used to be good advice. Like because you had that connection limit to a server in HTTP one, uh, we would use lots of servers and up that limit. But now that's bad advice because with HTTP two we only need that one connection. Uh, but if it's on another server, we have to set up another connection, and that takes time. That can be a couple of seconds on three G. Um, I also say like I think round trip time and as a result, creating a new connection to a server is one of the costliest things in the first load of a page. Absolutely. Not not too bad if it's for secondary content. So I wouldn't worry about that. But it's bad for primary content. I would say I, I really like Unpackage. And I use it on a lot of uh, like prototypes and playing around and that sort of thing. But <laughs> Unpackage will also redirect to the latest version of the library by default. So what, what happens here is you end up paying a connection cost. And then it does a redirect, and that tells the browser to go and request something else. Uh, and I saw this on a few sites, and that is just like on 3G, seconds, seconds and seconds worth of time just wasted on just finding out the right thing to download. Yeah, not great. All right, next up, number four, external font services. This is a little bit similar to the previous one, but it's so commonly specific to font services that I, I wanted to give it its own place in this list. A lot of font services are not your friend when it comes to web performance. Um, and that's a shame because we all like to use web fonts. It's very you know, nice to have a different design on the page. So the problem starts here. We've got a render blocking resource, CSS, but it's on another server. So we need another connection. So there's a couple of seconds. But then they tend to serve the fonts themselves on yet another server. So that's yet another connection, another couple of seconds wasted. Even if it was the same server, it, it doesn't matter because font files are requested using cores, uh, and they that will always use another connection uh, if it's no credentials. So that's 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 a fact not many people know. Uh, yeah, if you're making a cross-origin request, if it's with cores, uh, you know, like fonts or like you know fetch or xhr or whatever, that will use a different connection to say an image file or a CSS file or a script file because uh, it it wants to keep that boundary for privacy reasons. So yeah, anyway, another connection. And then some even go on to do this, where it's like, <laughs> uh, yeah, like a, a style sheet is requesting another style sheet. And that's even more render blocking time. It's it's bad. It's just really bad. Because this also this import isn't discovered early. So it while you know it might not create a new connection, it will definitely incur another round trip because now this file has to request it before any more processing can be done. Yes, and I have seen cases where it's on. Yet another server as well. <laughs> so Great. it's just an absolute disaster. <laughs> yeah, when you've got a style sheet that loads of style sheets, uh, you could use a, a preload, you know, to say it, that makes it happen in parallel rather than in series. You can do that with the font itself as well. Uh, just make sure you use uh, cross origin on there. But again, remember that those URLs might change. If you're using them on a different service, you know, you might put all of these preloads in, and then tomorrow they've changed their URLs, and now you're preloading a bunch of stuff that you don't even use, and that's even worse for performance. If you don't know the full URL, you can use a pre-connect. That'll at least set up the HTTP connection sooner. Again, make sure you use cross-origin to tell it whether it's a, a cause connection or not. But really, the best solution is to bring those fonts and the CSS onto your own server. And you can do that with Google Fonts, because it's all open source, which is great. Uh, you can't do that with closed source fonts for various contractual and legal reasons. I mean, check with your 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 service that you use. Maybe they do allow it. Maybe they don't. But I think yeah, most don't. Some will allow it, but only if you pay them a bazillion dollars. You know, they they tend to up the price for doing that, which is not great. So what you can do is you can do something like this. You can async load your CSS. So this is using a preload tag to load some CSS with high priority. And then you've got the actual uh, you know, style sheet tag there. Initially uses a print media, which means it will load low priority. But that's so your preload will bump the priority back up. But it means it won't block the rendering of the page either. And then once it loads, you switch the media, and it applies to the page. This is some arcane JavaScript magic, by the way. Yes, well, this is the, the, the filament group came up with this. And it used to be a lot worse um, before we had things like preload to be able to do this. So this is much better than it used to be. Um, you'll also want to use the font loading API 
to provide a smooth transition because this will this will just do swap uh, swap fonts mm. uh, and unless you add some css to change that you can add as much css as you want to control this process with the font loading api so there you go not easy but it's okay for font services uh, that won't let you do anything better than this it's better than blocking rendering uh, for all of that time all right getting to the final few ones layout instability and this is this is a big one um it's kind of different to the other ones because it might not be part of your main content code. It might not be part of your first interaction code. But if something comes in late and adds stuff to the page, which moves stuff around, then your core content isn't ready. Like if your user's reading something and it moves from under them, it's not ready yet. It's so frustrating. Um, to avoid it, like JavaScript should enhance what's already there in the DOM. Uh, so if you've got an image carousel, you would start with the first image there and it would be, you know, the correct width and height taking up space on the page. And then the JavaScript comes in and adds the buttons, uh, or hydrates that part of the page, depending on what terminology you, you're using. Uh, but adding those buttons, those buttons would just appear rather than shifting around other content on the page. It's just, yeah, horrible user experience when stuff shifts around. And I'm really glad that we're, we're using metrics now to call out sites which which have a really bad experience here. Um, yeah, so test your pages on a slow connection and ensure stuff doesn't move around. Uh, one special mention, I would say, uh, a lot of sites still do this, where uh, this image will take up almost no space on the page, and then the browser will download enough of the image to know its width and height, and then pop, it will take up the, the correct aspect ratio space on the page, and everything else shifts around. Don't have to do this anymore. If you give the image a width and a height, it doesn't have to be correct, just the correct aspect ratio. And then auto height, the browser will reserve space for that image. No shift, which is great. And with the aspect ratio CSS property, you can give the same behavior to things that are not images. If you have something that hasn't any content in it, but you want to reserve something with a certain aspect ratio, Use the aspect ratio CSS property. Yes. I, what is the browser support good enough for that yet? I know. I thought so. Oh, I will put a link in the I'm description. I'm going to do some. I'm going to put do some really quick oh. live can I using. Excellent. Live fact checking. Aspect ratio. And it's um, in Chrome, and I think it's in Firefox. It might not be in Safari. No. I well, the thing is that yeah, it might. It's not in fourteen point one, so. It, yeah, maybe it's not ready yet, but I feel like they were deeply involved in specking this. It is in the next Firefox. Next Firefox, next Chrome. Oh, there you yeah. go. That's, yeah. I, I, I've been wanting that forever. Good bit of aspect ratio. Indeed. But this image thing landed much sooner. It's still relatively new, like in terms of the age of the web, but it's you know it works across all browsers now, which is really yes. nice. You don't get that layout shift. You don't have to use the padding hacks, that the sort of stuff. That oh, God, the padding hack. I'll put a link to that as well in case anyone's trying to target some super old browsers. Uh, next, we're at number two now. This is over bundling. Um, so this is a little, or as I call it, under splitting. Under splitting. <laughs> that's that's a better name for it. <laughs> and yeah, it's a form of inlining, isn't it? Um, but this is mostly about CSS and JavaScript. Um, inlining JavaScript in JavaScript and inlining CSS in CSS. And it's it's much more common of a problem. Uh, a lot of sites will have one JavaScript file for their whole site or one CSS file for their whole site. And that means any given page, the user is downloading like a chunk of the website, the entire website, just to get to that first interaction or, or even the first render. The Google I.O. website, if you visit like the link to our talk, you download, but before you even get to render, you download all of the animation data for the home page, even though you are not on the home page. I like no, <laughs> it's it's like six hundred k or whatever it is. It's absolutely massive. Like it, also the Google I/O website. It, it, it feels okay to say nasty things about one of our own sites. I know it's it's you know don't want to do it too frequently to other people's websites, but oh good god, the Google I/O website isn't great, is it? And they've also got like a, all of the UI strings in a bunch of other languages. Like most users are only going to see one language, but it's like the Rosetta Stone in there, mate. <laughs> it's 
<laughs> it's incredible. <laughs> anyway, don't don't do that. Um, Chrome DevTools has this excellent coverage report that you can do. Uh, you reload your page and it'll tell you how much of your JavaScript and CSS is being used. Uh, it's it's a good way to identify a, a problem early on. Like sometimes you've got a, a huge bit of JavaScript that is used, but you, you shouldn't need that much JavaScript to do a thing. You know, this won't highlight that. But you can see in this case, uh, there's a bunch of JavaScript being downloaded that isn't being used. Just because there's some script unused isn't a problem, because if it's part of your everything else low priority bundle, that's fine. But for your blocking render stuff or for your first interaction stuff, you want to see a high coverage there because you just want it to contain the stuff that you really, really need. We built a, a website. Remember this one? I, I do. Uh, we looked at various bundlers to see you know, how they do things. And one of the things we looked at is code splitting. Uh, so the information is here for a bunch of different uh, bundlers for how you would split that out and ideally have an entry point for every type of page on your site. Not literally every page, but like on the Google I.O. website, you would have one entry point for the home page and one entry point for uh, the page that displays the information about an individual session. All right, we're at the end now. It's the final one, number one. Oh. And it is this. Uh... Content loaded with JavaScript. The fastest way to get to first render on your page is HTML and CSS. And doing it with JavaScript is always going to be slower. If you really, really optimize things, you can get close, but it will always be slower. And usually, it is a lot slower. Because uh, you, you, I mean, by very definition, the index HTML file is the first one that the browser loads. Like everything else will come in later. Yeah, and you, and so the more you have in there, the better you're doing. You can end up with a pattern like this, where your HTML downloads, and then you know the browser goes, "There's some JavaScript. I'll download that." And then the JavaScript downloads and it executes and whatever, and then the JavaScript goes, well, actually, I need some data from this 300k JSON file. And so go and fetch that. And then I'll look through that and find the data and put it on the page. It's it's slow. It's slow. And there are cases where it's your only option, depending on what APIs you're using or whatever. But really, it's very few. Uh, but it's a pattern I see in the wild a lot. And it is very slow. Even a static render that is just a UI shell will really help with this perception of performance. You know. Like, even if it's fairly basic, at least the user gets something other than just a, a white screen. But even better if you can do a content render just using your HTML and your CSS. And I, I'm going to be shamelessly plugging the talk that the two of us gave at Jamstack Conf, where we go through these steps. Like we, we send a shell, we t teach our build system to build a shell for a highly interactive web app, a game, and try to cut down the JavaScript required to get the first interaction going. Uh, and the game of all isn't that small. So that that walks you through those steps. Yep, that's a talk that we rehearsed to death. We spent so much effort rehearsing it. And then like I did the video edit myself because the, the conference's video didn't come out very well. And about 300 people watched it. So yeah, yeah, we'll send more people <laughs> to that video. <laughs> Get my money's worth out of that one. I do want to call out a specific form of this problem, which I've seen a couple of times and I didn't. I didn't realize how bad it was at first. Um, it's when this happens. So I think this happens when the developer will notice a lot of layout shifting on the page as their JavaScript is loading in. So they'll hide it with an overlay that might have a loading spinner in, or just say the word loading or something. And then the main JavaScript loads, uh, and they remove that overlay. Ta-da! This suffers from priority issue. So if you've got a blocking bit of JavaScript in the head of your page, the browser's like, whoa, I am going to fire all the bandwidth at that, because that is blocking rendering. It does the same with CSS. And it will do this, like sort of the same with fonts as well, a different phase. And then things like images, if they're in the viewport, it starts pouring bandwidth into those. Like, the browser tries to do this so it gets the, the fastest load time. Of course it does. But this tricks the browser. Because it sees the script at the bottom of the page and goes, nah. Not important. Not important. You already have your nice black overlay with a spinner. The user is happy. We've got a bunch of content on the page here. And that, that's going to include images and CSS backgrounds. So I better get those ready like in parallel with the JavaScript. And that, that's what happens. It, it tends to the images uh, end up the same priority or even higher priority than that script at the bottom. You've created a, a blocking experience, but not one that the browser 
actively recognizes as a blocking experience. So your recommendation is put the spinner first, put a blocking <laughs> script, and not a first script, in the middle, and then the content after, right? Do you know what? That would be faster. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing. That would actually be faster. But no, like the, the truly, uh, yeah, the best thing you could do here is a proper static render uh, that gives you the contents with, with no layout shifting. Um, or if you have this problem, if you do just want to do a quick fix, link rel preload as script in the head of the document there, and the browser will bump the priority of, of that script loading uh, at least. That's not a perfect solution, but if you've got 10 minutes, that is a solution that will improve things <laughs> massively, uh, especially depending if you've got a few big images on the page. And that's all I've got. Um, I'll put some links into the articles I wrote where I looked at individual sites. Um, that includes videos. So you can see how many seconds are added by each of these you know, performance gotcha pitfall things and how fast things could be if, you know, alternatives were used, which are much better for performance. And and we're going to link to our talk. And all of you watching should watch that one, because we need more views on that one. Yes, please. Thank you very much. Uh, but yeah, please, please go and do that. Yeah. <laughs> so close to the end. So close to the end. <laughs> Why didn't I? I'll wing it. I'll just wing it. I don't need notes. I've got all this in my head. I've been doing this job for 20 years. <laughs> All right, well, that's some good B-roll.